Uh, I just wanted to make sure I, I give you all something before I get started. Uh, the website down at the bottom, that's completely free. I built it for Nutrient. You can access it, ag-wx.com. It's not a pitch for anything. It's just where I put all my stuff. And I hope that in the next six months, we're going to do a complete revamp of the site, make it more user-friendly. I got some fun stuff that I've been building in the background that's going to go on to it. And uh, by the way, the WX is how we abbreviate weather. Uh, that comes from Morse code. So we used to tap out weather in Morse code. It was just WX real quick. So that's, uh, that's just a fun resource there. Uh, so it's been an interesting uh, year this year. I've actually, this is my fifth time in, in South Dakota since December. And this is also the fourth time I've managed to travel here without a winter coat. So I mean, it's not cold outside. I mean, I know the weather's crappy, but uh, it's not, uh, it's been so mild except for the one trip I made in the middle of January. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And, um, and also, I will tell you this, the last night, so I was in Kansas City yesterday, flew to Dallas, Dallas to here. And when we were coming in about the last thousand feet of the atmosphere we were going through, I, I fly a lot, but that flight last night was memorable <laughs> because there's a 40 mile an hour crosswind out of the south. And when we came in, this has only happened to me twice. It is both times happened at the south, uh, Sioux Falls airport. But um, as we came in uh, to, to land, that pilot has to come in at an angle. And twice in my life have I looked out my window and been able to see the runway on approach. <laughs> so we kind of come in sideways. And have you ever seen them do this? It's incredible. Like they cut, and the last second is like, er, I, when we landed, uh, half of the plane clapped. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was really well done. I'm, <laughs> thank you for not killing all of us. But yeah, it was a pretty rough, uh, rough night. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some high impact weather events. I want to give you the best that I can give you, what I think about for spring and summer, and kind of tell you about some of the big things that you'll be hearing a lot about. Uh, but if you don't mind, right away at the very beginning of this, I would like to just attack some of the garbage that I'm hearing from a lot of folks right now. Because it is February, and there's lots of meetings like this, and there's a lot of people out there that are making bold claims about what they think the upcoming year is going to be, and it's just it just boggles my mind. So we're going to spearhead some of that, give you some level head you know, thought process on it, get rid of some of the pseudoscience and let you know what we really kind of know about this. So anyway, let's go on into this. I'm going to show you a figure I think a lot of you can recognize pretty quickly. That would be corn prices since 1959. Uh, last week, I'm driving down to Nashville for an event over the weekend, and I pulled off the road uh, right where uh, Interstate 57 turns into 24. Now, this is quite a ways away from me, but I just want to tell you something. The worst stretch of road in America is Clarksville to Chattanooga. If you've never driven it, don't. Avoid it like the plague. So when I got to where that begins, I'm like, I'm just going to pull off and just uh, chill out for a minute, close my eyes. Well, I woke up two hours later, uh, and i like, I better, I got to get to Nashville. But in that time period when I woke up, I, it was kind of like refreshed, and I started thinking about something. And the thing I started thinking about was these data. Because as you look at it, and you look back to 1959 all the way to present, the volatility in corn prices is huge. And so I started just to think about what we could do with this to help us kind of understand how much that's changed. So I decided to stratify it by decade. Now, for you that are colorblind in the audience, okay, the bottom is the 1950s and 60s. The top is the most recent data. It's kind of fun to see this, right? Look at the value of this commodity we all grow and how much it's changed in price over time. The lines at the bottom are relatively flat. They don't change very much, but the ones at the top do, the most recent years. It's amazing just to think about that because I was with a group in Illinois last weekend as well. It was all young farmers. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. When Grandpa was farming the ground you farm now, if the price of corn moved four cents in a day, we talked about it for a week. Like, that was what happened in the 80s. Like, oh, corn's up four. Oh, my gosh. We'll call everybody. we got to do something. If corn only changes four cents today, everyone's like, well, thank God, it was nothing happened. <laughs> you know, we, we, we look for limit up and limit down all the time. So I, I kept thinking about this. And if you think this looks like somebody barfed colorful spaghetti, I decided next to do it this way. <laughs> and what you've got here is I took every single year in the data set and I decided to find the average price of every year from 1959 on. And then I calculated throughout each year what the difference is between any given day and its average price. And I did this just to see if any sort of patterns would start to show up. And it's kind of fun. We've all heard about seasonalities and the prices of our commodities. Can you actually see it in there? If not, I'll kind of overlay it for you. Look at the middle there. There's a lot of years which we have a nice good spring rally. Then things drop off in the summer when they know the size of the U.S. crop. And then sometimes at the end, they kind of build up. We have years, and we'll talk more about these in a second, that really skyrocket early and then collapse epically. And also at the very end of this, something that's unique to the last 20 years or so, there's this massive fanning out of prices that we didn't used to have to deal with up until really since the 2000s. 
And I just kept thinking more and more about this. And I said, well, what it is about those years in spring that make huge rallies? Because every one of us in this room would love it if we could get another 8, 11, 21, or 22, where those first 150 days, we just gained and gained and gained. And it gave us a great idea when to market that grain because those nice spring rallies resulted in better marketing plans throughout the year, right? Gives you a better idea what you got in terms of money in the bank. Well, what makes those happen? We better talk about that in a few minutes. And then I got to thinking, what about the middle, the middle time period, the, the, the May 10th to September 10th? I call these the chaos years. There are some times where price volatility in the middle of the year is absolutely epic. I mean, a lot of us go back and think, well, 2012 is a great example of that. Remember, we had record warmth in March. We were planting crops in South Dakota as early as April 15th that year. <laughs> And everything was in the ground and going fast. And then all of a sudden, by the middle of July, we realized we had no rain and the price just fluctuated. In fact, the arrow doesn't really show you what the change is because it's relative to 2012. But that spike up in the middle is $3. That's how much the corn market gained. And then you think about a year like last year, where we came in with huge drought early, and then it started to rain, especially in the ice states, starting in July. And the $1.50 we gained in the market, well, we lost $1.75 after the rain started to come back through. What is it about those years? We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. And just thinking a bit more about that, I want to put it all into one final figure for you before we dive into some of this. What I was really curious about is, what are we up against in terms of just understanding volatility? So what I graphed from 1959 all the way to present is the 30-day rolling variance of corn prices. Now, what does that mean? This would be kind of trying to capture how much day in and day out, the prices are fluctuating. And it's just amazing. For some of you that have been farming for a long time, I make the joke about a four cent move in the price of corn being something we discussed. I mean, it's right here. Look at this. You come from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even early 2000s. We had such small variance day to day in the prices. And now it is just common from, from 2010 on to have huge swings in the prices of our commodities. And I just bring this up because I was trying to explain to a person that's not in ag what it's like to be in agriculture. They don't understand the concept of having a situation where you have one good year in five, where you have a lot of money made once and then four years after that of losing all your money back, right? I mean, they just don't get it. They don't understand the concept of not getting a paycheck every two weeks. And they really don't understand risk. I mean, I found myself talking to a person last week about what this looks like. And I said, what the problem is in agriculture is that we can't deflect risk. You don't have an option to push it off onto a consumer because the consumer wants to have steady grocery prices. And what's really odd about the modern consumer right now, I still think there's a large percentage of our population that thinks that the groceries are made at the grocery store. Like they don't understand the entire machine behind all of it. And the reality is, is when there's massive fluctuations in supply or demand, you don't have the option of looking for some sort of steady course forward. You have to continually market your grain and grow that grain and all of that volatility. And I've just been thinking a lot about that volatility and the way by which we can maybe de-risk the entire agricultural system. And to be honest with you, the previous presenter and the programs that are being discussed up here, that's a huge component of it. But being really, really good at understanding your marketing plan and understanding how weather's gonna influence it is also a, a major part of this. But the reality of it is this, and I'm just gonna be very honest and frank with you right at the beginning today. If you think there is somebody out there, myself included, that can actually predict where this is all gonna go, not just tomorrow, but for the summer, you're, you're, you're wrong. I'm just gonna leave it at that. There are people that love to get up in front of you on a stage like this and make massively bold claims on where they think things are gonna go. And you know that almost every time you have those folks that get up here and talk, what do they do? They predict disaster. And what's funny about it is I don't think they know what disaster is in agriculture because they want to tell you about repeats of really, really terrible weather years. I mean, I was just in Illinois listening to a guy the other day who was like, we just can't get another 2012. I'm like, what are you talking about? All of the people in that audience made a boatload of money in 2012. We cashed in on insurance. We still had a little bit of grain to sell. And guess what we did? We sold the 2013 and the 2014 crop on all of that. Bad weather years are not disaster years. Disaster is super high interest rates, massive global supply, low global demand, a huge Brazilian crop. Disaster is when input prices are high and commodity prices are low. That's disaster for us. 
Those are the four years where things are terrible versus the one year where somebody has a problem. And I understand it. I'm in South Dakota today. You would love it if your neighboring state of Iowa and then the other state, Illinois, would just have terrible weather. And I'm going to tell you something. When I'm there, they want all of you to have terrible weather. We, we're like, just hammer the Western Corn Belt. Just get them, you know. But this, this is it. This is the world in which we live in today. And I want to try to give you some sense of, of what we're predicting, but also what other people are talking about with respect to this. So this bit of my talk here kind of started back in early January or mid-January, I guess it was, when I found my first presentation from another quote-unquote meteorologist sent to me. And it reminded me of something the pastor said right in front of the pulpit a few weeks ago when he pulled out Paul's second letter to Timothy and gave us this. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And we have itching ears in agriculture. Do you know why you have itching ears? Why you let things that talk about major risk rent space in your brain, even if the thing that's being discussed isn't real? We, we, we do that because we don't have a choice. The off chance of some massive disaster happening, ruining my plan, affects me and my family, my operation, and everything. And it's, it's something we worry about. We worry more than any other industry. I have to say that by far. I've met you all. I know what you worry about because you ask me about it all the time. I mean, the first thing I get them here, hey, does this fog mean anything? What do you, fog? It's fog in February. Don't worry about it, man. We'll talk about all that later. But we do that. We just always look for these things to try to understand if something in the future is going to cause major problems. And what do they always do? They always talk about disaster. The best thing I could do for you today, for me, I guess I should say, the best thing for me to do for you all today is to paint a picture where it's going to be terrible. Do you know why that's smart for guys like me to do that? We rely on two things. One, your short-term memory loss. That helps. <laughs> but the second thing is this. Let's say that there is no disaster in 2024. No problems. You have a great year. Everything's normal. You're doing fine. I'll come back here next February after making up some big story this year about how bad it's going to be, and I'll just wipe my brow and go, whew, <laughs> dodged a bullet. Thank God. We're all okay. And you'll be like, yeah, that was, that was close. It wasn't close. It was a bunch of garbage. But what, what happens if I came here and I just made up some story about a whole bunch of different things that caused disaster? And then there's a disaster, regardless of whether it was what I said it was or not, but there's a disaster. You elevate me to profit status. So you see, the best thing I could do is lie to you today, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you what I know, and I'm also going to tell you that expect it to change. And that's why I put out forecast content every day, so you can see kind of my rolling thoughts on how things are going. So thinking about this, I want to show you what I've been up against. This is at the top slide of uh, two presentations that were sent to me last week. Disaster's coming, you better get ready for volatility. I'm like, wait a minute, we're in ag. All we have is volatility, but whatever. The first thing says uh, there's a massive volcano that erupted in January 2022. That's going to absolutely destroy the crop. Where? Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, South Dakota. I mean, it's all going to hit it right here, right? That's where the problem is going to be. we got to talk about that. How many of you in the room have heard that there is cyclical behavior to drought because of sunspots? Just put them up real high. I'm not going to call anybody. Have you heard this? Major drought cycles. Come. We're going to talk about that. We're then going to get over to this, El Nino. Now, this is going to be a fun part of the discussion. What the heck is going on with all the warm water right there, and where is it expected to go? I have heard people make extremely bold claims. In fact, I read two of them in the back of the room that this El Nino is going to collapse epically and cause not just drought, but the kind of drought that impacts U.S. food security. Unfounded, but they put it in an article, and guess how many eyeballs it gets on Twitter today? That's what they're talking about. Just to give you another one, this is no joke. I just read this last week. There's a guy out there peddling that the planets are going to align and pull hard on Earth's gravity, forcing a drought in July. Like, what are you talking about? This is not, this isn't what we do. But can you imagine if I just came in and I showed you all these slides and instead of being skeptical, I was like, yes, 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 this is going to happen. You wouldn't, you all think I'm smart and I would just be, oh, this is it. And there was one other guy that came out and said that something's happening at the top of the atmosphere, 200,000 feet above our heads, not in the layer we live in, but way up there in the mesosphere where it's squeezing right now. I'm like, but it doesn't, it doesn't squeeze. Like, why would you even say that? But he says it's going to make the jet stream real wavy. 
put a massive ridge, guess where? Over the center of Western Corn Belt, ruining our crops. Every one of these things has been about a disaster in the Corn Belt, ignoring the rest of the world. It's just right here. That's what he's talked about. Four of them, not, not just a he. There's four he's in this situation. So I'd like to undo two of these pseudoscience moments for you because the last two are absolutely ridiculous. We're not even going to give them the time of day. And then I want to get into what we do know and what we don't know. And I'm going to show you the long-range projections that I've got for you today. We're going to paint, hopefully, a better scenario about what we can actually project about going in the future. So are you ready for this? Let me show you what I'm up against. I've been using this example and the one that follows it since I started giving these talks last September. I got asked, why don't you tweet more? Why don't you put more content out? I don't because there's a bunch of morons on the internet that love to comment on everything I say. My favorite on my YouTube channel is this guy named BushelChaser69. He always has something stupid to say about my videos. And he, he th I don't know if he thinks he knows. There's another one called Bushel Chaser. He's good. I like that guy. But Bushel Chaser 69, this guy comes in every time and just tells me I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, well, how many degrees do you have? And who even are you? He's probably some 12-year-old kid sitting in his mom's basement on the computer just messing around on YouTube. I don't know who he is. But it's hard to put content out there, good content because you have a bunch of armchair quarterbacks who think they know more than you would do about it. So I'm sorry I don't put out more on social media, but this is what I feel like I'm up against every day. I'm also up against this. September 8th, Hurricane Lee. I've been using this example all fall because it's so important to me to remember the lesson I learned from this. That's a Cat 5 hurricane. On Saturday, after this image was taken, I was asked by a group I work with in the Carolinas to put together a forecast video to tell them the risk of this hurricane hitting the Carolinas. Hurricane Lee in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Cat 5, it's a monster. They want to know, is it going to hit? I understand why they wanted to know that, because back in 2018, in that exact same position was another hurricane at Category 5 strength. Five days later, it hit North Carolina and South Carolina, and it dropped 57 inches of rain in Wilmington, which is near Cape Fear. And if you're wondering, that's called uh, Genesis chapter 7 flooding. 57 inches of rain. So they are curious and they are worried. Is this thing going to hit us? We've been hearing people say that it's going to hit us. Can you put together a forecast video? Sure. I woke up early Saturday morning. I spent four hours looking at everything I could look at for this. And what I arrived at in my conclusions was that the hurricane's going to miss. Using every model simulation I had, looking at all the steering currents of this thing, I'm like, I don't, there's no evidence in the data that it's going to hit the Carolinas. Now, you never say never. But I told him, I, have, I can't even assign a statistical probability of it hitting you because everything I know right now is going to make a hard right turn and it's going to head up toward Nova Scotia or Maine or Newfoundland and probably hit somewhere up there. So I wrapped that video up. It was 28 minutes long of me just talking about every bit of evidence I had as to what was going to go on. So I wrapped the video up. I put it in an email, sent it off to those clients, and I checked at 10 a.m. how many people watched the video. 3,700 people. And I'm sitting in my basement at home with my chest all puffed out like, wow, I just, I got 3,700 people to listen to me this morning. And then at noon, someone sent me an email back and asked, have you seen this? And there was a link to a TikTok video. This young lady also on Saturday morning was forecasting the weather. But she was doing it with a little bit different technique than the rest of us use. She was using her psychic capabilities to predict where Hurricane Lee was going to go. I think I just narrowed down where I think this Hurricane Lee is going to go. Well, what did she do? She drew it for us. She put on a pen on paper and drew a squiggly line. And it turns out, in the video, she actually tells us she drew this with her eyes closed. So this is getting interesting, right? Psychic lady predicts weather. And then after she drew the line, in 90 seconds, that's all the longer the video is, she says, what is that? She drew an arrow toward it. She says, doesn't that look exactly like the coastline of North Carolina, right near Wilmington? where Hurricane Florence hit in 2018. Looks just the same, doesn't it? And in 90 seconds, she concludes with, I would honestly be shocked if I was wrong. It's going to hit North Carolina. Now, what was the lesson I learned? I laughed my head off at this. It was funny. I've actually watched it like 10 times. Until you scroll to the bottom of the video and saw that she had 13.6 million views. <laughs> So you're sitting there kind of going like, wait, wait a minute. Maybe what I should do is stop putting together 28-minute videos that explain everything I know about it and just say, no, it's not going to hit. <laughs> or just pretend that I can forecast psychically. I don't know. Maybe that works. You know what's crazy is, what if, it 
What if it would have, what if she got it right on accident? And I was wrong. By the way, I was right. It missed, okay? I, nobody patted me on the back. They're like, get to the next storm, Eric. We, we knew it missed, but if she would have been right, even though what she did was complete garbage, she would have been elevated, right? To like, she'd been on every talk show around the nation. They would, how did you do it? Well, I just color with my eyes. <laughs> As far as I know, in history, there's only been one successful forecast by someone using psychic capabilities. We wrote about him 3,500 years ago in the book of Genesis. He had a pretty colored coat on, right? He forecast for Pharaoh and nailed 14 years of a forecast. No one's ever done it since. So please, please be better consumers of information like this. But I bring you through all of that because I'm going to get to something a bit more serious. While we can laugh at this lady saying she's forecasting with her psychic capabilities, There are people touting around as scientists that are pitching this. Now, what you're going to see in this graph, as I animate it, is sunspot cycle data going back to the 1700s. Now, what's a sunspot? Our sun goes through a regular cycle because it's a massive convection machine where it puts out these cooler spots on its surface. And they just show up in numbers. And we've been measuring the number of them very regularly for a very long time. Now... For about 25 years, there's been a group of people that have latched onto an idea about sunspot cycles. And what they've made a claim about was that there was a massive drought in 1847. And then 89 years later, there was a massive drought in 1936. And it appeared that these two events happened at the same spot in a sunspot cycle. And based off of this and some other historical data analysis, which was a bit wishy-washy, they said that 89 years from then, in 2025, there's going to be another big one. That's next year now. Now, the guy that made this up is since retired. And I respect him, but he never peer-reviewed this research and had it published. He just wrote an article about it and then has been telling the world about it. Now, first of all, just let me tell you something here. In the sunspot cycle, this is where we expect to be. See the black arrow? We do not expect to be in the same positions we were in those two previous years. But if I ever got a chance to meet this man, I would say, well, what about all of the drought that happens in the middle of those 89-year cycle? Like, where, what, how do you account for all of that? What is so special about these droughts? Because to be honest, even though 1847, 1936 were bad, we've actually had worse droughts. They were in the 1950s. We had one that was in 1988, one that was in 12, that doesn't fit on this. But I was interested in answering this question. So a decade ago, when I was a professor at University of Illinois, I asked my department head, hey, I want to take on a side project, if you don't mind. He's like, what do you want to do? I said, I like to study of drought cyclical. And he goes, do you want me to just tell you what you're going to find out? And I said, no, I want to do the research myself and figure it out. I said, but anyways, what are you going to tell me? He's like, well, we're going to, you're going to find out that it's not cyclical. He says, why do you want to do this? I said, because think of the power we'd have as forecasters if we had some level of certainty on predicting drought years or months in advance. I mean, can you just imagine that I came in here with solid evidence, statistical evidence, that could point you in the direction that would say that, mate, 2025 is going to be epically dry. And I could say it with confidence and prove it to you that it was going to happen. You know what you'd all do? You wouldn't sell anything in 2024, would you? I'd wait. Put all that in the bin. Let's wait until that massive rally comes back and we can get some <laughs> movement in these markets. I want to know the answer to that. He says, we already figured this out in the 1950s. Why are you trying this again? I'm like, well, I need to do it again. He says, all right, go. I spent five years of my life trying to answer this question. Now, I was doing other things, but I was in the background working on this research trying to figure this out. So what I actually found at the end of it was drought's not cyclical. Like, I couldn't find it. I could find no evidence of this. And I need you to understand that I went into this research wanting to find evidence. I was a hammer looking for nails, and I found none. And what I want to show you is something that kind of crippled my ego a little bit back in January. Because I was sitting in a hotel in Tucson, Arizona. I was at a conference down there. Brought my whole family down. They're out swimming in the pool. But I had to finish up a presentation for the next morning. And I'm like, you know what would be kind of fun? What if I gave ChatGPT my research questions and all of the data to see if it can come to the same conclusions? (laughs) How many of you have used some form of AI? Not artificial insemination, but artificial intelligence. Okay. Anybody? Chat GPT people, put your hand up real high. Just like this, get a count. Okay, this is about 2% of you. That's, that's interesting. So I gave it some data. This is the data I gave it. Uh, 1895 to present. What you see in the spikes down, this is all the wet time periods. The one on the top are the drought episodes. Now, by the way, if you just eyeball this, do you think you can find a cycle in that? No, it doesn't look like there's, it looks quite random, actually. But I decided to give it to ChatGPT, 
And what took me five years took JetGPD nine and a half minutes. I edited it because I recorded the screen while I did this to show you what it's capable of doing. I gave it a prompt. Let's figure out what's going on with drought. And if it's cyclical, I fed it in the data and then I recorded my screen. It says, oh, let's analyze that for you, Eric. It's very polite. Have you ever used it? It actually says like, oh, certainly. You're welcome. <laughs> well, anyways, it's going through it. It says, is this what your data looks like? I'm like, yep, that's it. That's exactly it. Can we actually use some of these complicated techniques like principal component analysis to look at the cyclical behavior of drought? It says, sure, that graph and that graph. And then this next one that pops up right there, that was three years of my life writing code. <laughs> and you know what it says? You want to predict drought in the future, your best indicator is drought today. I'm like, well, that's useless. That doesn't actually help at all. I said, let's get a little bit deeper into this. Is drought predictable based on this analysis? This is what you need to do more. I said, well, why don't we use uh, something different, maybe Fourier analysis, or how about we use ARIMA? That's a statistical technique. It made that graph. That's another year of my life right there. And it keeps giving me more information. I said, hey, let's explore more advanced models using machine learning. It says, well, certainly, Eric, what would you like to use? I'd like to use the same algorithm that Netflix uses to predict your next video that you're going to watch, which is called the random forest. And then I said, can you use the last 40 years as input to predict the next 10 years of drought? And ChatGPT said, you bet. This is easy, man. So it just analyzes the data, cranks through it, and gives me that graphic. Now, you ready for what it did? I'll show you that graphic. It's right here. That analysis says on the y-axis, that's the drought area in the Midwest. It actually says 2025, when everybody's predicting massive drought, we'll have the lowest drought area over the next decade. It says the next big drought episode is 2030. <laughs> and I need to tell everybody something important about this. This is garbage. It's not real. <laughs> I asked it to do the same thing again, but train the data on 30 years versus 40, and I did it on 50. It gives me an entirely different solution. Do you know why it's not real? You can't apply these techniques to these data sets because weather is nonlinear in its behavior and chaotic. Therefore, by its very definition, just like the markets, you can't predict it. You can't. It's not possible. This is my point in showing you this. Imagine I wanted to sell you a subscription. I need your 1500 bucks this year. And I just put that in my, my monthly email to you. I said, hey, I just did some new analysis. We looked at all this drought history. We did this. We put, used all these big fancy words, which I just shared with you. Random tree. We don't know what that means. But, but look, it says 2030 is the year to look out for. And I just went through it and lied to you. And maybe I didn't even know how it worked. But I used it. I'm going to tell you something about artificial intelligence. I use it every day. It's a part of my workload every single day. This is what artificial intelligence is going to do. It's going to amplify experts. And it's going to amplify idiots all at the same time. This is going to accelerate the rate at which you receive garbage information, and that is garbage. It's not cyclical. We proved it. There's 25 peer-reviewed publications that also prove that this is garbage as well. But let's get on to the next topic. Oh, by the way, before I do that, just so you are aware of this, these two maps represent summer and the correlation between temperature and precip and solar cycles. Now, if you don't know what a correlation is, if the correlation value is 1, something is perfectly correlated with something else. If it is minus 1, it's inversely correlated. If it's 0, there's no correlation. Look at the colors. We're right around 0. <laughs> there's no correlation. You can't use this to do anything. So please understand that when someone comes out and says disaster, either this year or next year because of sunspot cycles, that I told you you're not allowed to use that to forecast the weather. But people are doing it right now. They're also using the volcano as their main kind of reason for there to be problems. Do you remember this? That January 2022, that sucker erupted, and it did something most volcanoes don't do. Most volcanoes put sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, and that gives us a global cooling effect for about 18 months. This volcano sat 450 meters below the ocean's surface, and when it blew, it vaporized all of that water and sent it into the stratosphere, which is the layer above where we live. The stratosphere is statically stable. It's a stratified layer, which means you put stuff up there, it stays up there for a long time. And when all that water vapor, which is Earth's most abundant greenhouse gas, was put into the stratosphere, we began to ask questions. What is it going to do to Earth's temperatures? Because when stuff goes into the stratosphere, it sticks around. 
Now, if this would have not made it to the stratosphere and never gotten out of the troposphere, all of the water vapor that it produced when the heat from that volcano vaporized it would literally rain out in about five days. It'd be back in the ocean. But it's sitting up in the stratosphere, and that's where it currently is to this day. That's all this graph says down here. What's the point of me telling you this? I've heard so many people want to blame massive heat episodes, drought episodes on this volcano. And they're just using it because it was a weird event that most people don't understand how it works. There's been one really good peer-reviewed publication about it that talks about what happened when you put all of the stratus as water vapor in the stratosphere. And what it concludes is expect about five, maybe up to 10 years of a global warming signal out of it. How much? 0.1 degrees Celsius. Now, when you think about that, what is the impact? Well, I've heard people say that this volcano is going to cause a massive drought. Guess where? Central Western Corn Belt. Let's use it for the heck. There's no, no evidence of any of that in here. In fact, that water vapor spread globally. It's not just sitting over the top of us, but people are making it sound as if this was some massive event that, <laughs> that's going to ruin us. I'm sorry, but if someone puts this in a newsletter that you receive or you go to another conference and there's another meteorologist and he's touting this volcanic eruption, he's full of crap and doesn't know what he's talking about. Check his credentials, please. And if they do not show you peer-reviewed evidence of things, then you really need to walk out of the back of the room. Okay, what about something a bit more real? Let's talk about something we do actually have to pay attention to because you better ignore those things when they come up in your inbox. Let's now show you the years where the very end in fall and early winter wildly changed the prices because they're all just in the last decade or two decades. One thing that we do have to contend with now that we didn't have to contend with in the past is high price volatility in our fall and winter. Normally that's the time of year where we didn't see much price action, but it's big now because of South America. So I want to give you what I know about South America. We'll move into a North American forecast, and then we'll wrap this all up today. So listen up. South America. The most important thing about South America is their very compact growing season. I say it's compact because they try to get two crops in. They're waiting on the monsoon to arrive in September, early October. They want to plant soybeans as fast as they can. The goal is to harvest those soybeans in January, February, and the very beginning of March. The moment they harvest soybeans, they follow up with a planter putting in what's called safrina corn. Safrina is a word when translated means small or second. There is nothing small about the safrina crop anymore. It is bigger than what we grow in the United States. So anything, anything that disrupts their crop calendar puts them too close to the safrina crop finishing in their winter dry season. So the month they worry the most about for corn is April. The month they worry about most for soybeans, the two months is December and January. That's when they should get all the rain. Now, how does the rain work down there? Take a look at the map on the left. The monsoon starts in the Atlantic, it goes across the Amazon, which is up here, into a place called the Serrata, which is in the middle. Out of the south, we have cold fronts that come through Argentina, and it all meets right in the middle to give them about three to four inches of rain a week. That's common. Now, every year I have the privilege of speaking to two different groups out of Brazil. DuPont brings up one of the groups and John Deere brings up the other. And every year I look forward to meeting just one guy out of those two groups when they come up to the University of Illinois. His name is Carlos. Carlos is part owner of a half million hectare operation. Part owner. And meeting someone that manages and owns that much land, you have, I just want to ask questions. And so the very first question I always ask Carlos is, okay, man, how many combines do you have? And his answer through the translator is about 50. I'm like, what do you mean about? Like, you don't have a no and you're like, well, they're all over the place. I'm not sure how many we have now. Like, who, who says that, right? I guess people that own a half million hectares of land do. Speaking with Carlos, though, I asked him a question. I said, my understanding of your drought scenario is this. If you only got an inch of rain in November, December, January, and February, an inch of rain per week, you're having major drought problems. He goes, yeah. I said, can I ask you a question? What if it rains an inch? in the middle of the day on one of, your, one of your fields. I was like, how long are you kept out of that field when you get an inch of rain? Because I'm just trying to understand what three to four inches of rain looks like a week. And he goes, if it rains an inch at noon, I can put heavy equipment on that field at 6 p.m. That's how fast their soil will drain. I'm like, man, that, that's absolutely crazy. So we just keep asking questions of this guy to figure out more and more about what his operation is like. And I'm gonna tell you those next questions when I show you this. You've probably seen me present this before. I just updated every year, get you the new data. This is from Conab, 1977 to 2023, three curves. The top is their yield, the middle is their production, the bottom is their area. I want to show you Brazil's massive advantage over all of us. Ready? Same colors and dashed lines, that is what the USDA would tell you. Our yield, 
our production, and our area planted is. They match our yield, but they outpace us in everything else. If you're curious, today, right now, Brazil farms an extra Ohio. 27 million acres is their, yield, or excuse me, is their uh, area planted advantage over us right now. What they end up getting out of that in terms of production is the equivalent of Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri in soybeans. So they have an extra Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri in terms of total production right now compared to what we've got. Now I look at that and I see that that middle curve, the production curve is exponential. So I asked Carlos, I said, what do you think production is going to look like over the next decade? Is it going to continue to go up like that? And I said, it's because I've heard that you have an extra 400 million acres of pasture, not rainforest, but pasture land that should you want to convert over to growing corn and beans, you can. That came out in two studies. One was in the U.S., one was done by Brazil. Well, they were both done with satellite data. I said, is that real? I asked the whole group. They go, yeah, that's real. We've got a whole lot of pasture land in the middle parts of Brazil. You know how much 400 million acres is? It's the entirety of the Great Plains of the United States. Those are the states we call the Great Plains. All the area that you see underneath them could still be farmed with corn and soybeans if they wanted, plus cotton, sugar cane, anything else they want to grow. I asked them, I said, well, realistically, 10 years from now in 2034, how much of that 400 million are you going to put into production? Now, this is just one man's answer. He says probably 50 million acres. That would be adding two more Ohios. That's just their land area, two more Ohios into production. I'm like, holy smokes. What does it take to put an acre into production? He says, well, we can do it for next year if we wanted to. It takes a lot. I got to go there and get all the shrub out, get all the rocks out, turn the ground over, and then I got to inject it full of everything to get it ready. I said, but ideally what I like to do is clear all the brush, put the cattle on it for five years, let them do their thing. And then after that, I'll come through, turn it over, and I'll put what I need in there to get the pH right, and then we go after it. I said, is your best ground still yet to be farmed? He goes, no, 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 we already got the best ground. This is not our marginal ground, though, but it is ground that will be productive should we decide to put it into production. And just thinking about that, I want us all to think about what this means. If, if they do add another 50 million acres over the next decade, what does it mean for our global supply? So I asked him that. I said, can you tell me what would prompt you to put in 50 million of these 400 million acres? He goes, yeah. He says, if someone's buying, I said, who's typically buying? He goes, well, China's buying. <laughs> I said, okay, I understand that. I said, what about your infrastructure problems? I hear there's always these issues with infrastructure. He says, well, we're solving our infrastructure problems. I said, tell me about it. He goes, it's not necessarily happening at the pace we want. There's not big railways going in, and our road network is terrible. They really wish they had an Eisenhower to make a national highway system. They don't have it. He says, but we have another way of getting around that. I'm like, well, what's the other way? He says, you all know what you did in the States in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s? I said, well, what did we do? He goes, we all put in on-farm storage, lots of it. For the last decade, we've been adding on-farm storage because we want to sell this crop at the right time, not just take it out of the combine, put it on the truck, and go straight to port and get that price. We'd like to take advantage of rallies, your rallies, the ones that happen in the United States. I said, well, that's kind of interesting. And he says, I'm going to tell you one more thing, Eric. He goes, just so you understand what life is like down here, I would rather have a soybean in the bin than hold a Brazilian real. I said, why? He goes, because you, it's against your dollar. That's what we want. So they're making some pretty massive changes in Brazil. We have to just be aware of this. Now, this isn't a scare tactic. This is just the data in a conversation I had. But I want you to understand that this is probably what they're going to go after in time. Now, I don't know what decisions need to be made on our end to understand what this could do for us. But it's certainly something we have to think about going forward. Now, do I have any Brazilians in the room? No Brazilians? None on the camera over here either? Okay. To be honest with you, we need Brazil to have problems all the time. <laughs> like we, now, when I talk to them, I'm like, eh, yeah. no, but we, we need to have weather issues. And they've had some weather issues this year. Did not give us what we expected. Here's the weather issue summed up in one 30-second statement. Record dry in the Amazon, followed by record dry October, November, December in the northern growing areas, the center west growing areas flooding in southern Brazil, and sneakily in the background, Argentina is having one of the best years it's ever had for weather. Last year, they were cut in half by epic drought. This year, they're having a fantastic year. Now, what does it look like? The center west growing area, which if you look, this state right here is Mato Grosso. You can put five, listen, five and a half South Dakotas inside of Mato Grosso. That's big. They have had down here in October, November, December record dryness. You understand, though, that over those three months, what their record dryness was, they still got a foot of rain. But remember, they don't have the soil that we have, so a foot of rain is a problem. 
But it wasn't just going back to 1981 that they had all of these issues. In fact, you can go back to the 1940s and still not find a year that was drier than inside that box than 2023. So all of the thinking was, when in the world is this going to hit the markets? Because I feel like the markets were in a wait and see mode. Like, ah, prove it. I want to prove that there's a problem. We made estimates. We said, you know what? You look back, the closest year to this was 2016. We think that yields are going to be up by 12%. What's 12%? Well, if they were expecting 165, we're projecting a crop of about 150 million metric tons. Just talking with close friends of mine, Arlen Suderman, Matt Bennett, last week, I just said, hey, what would it really have to be in order to get a market reaction? It certainly doesn't help that the USDA today increased by 2 million metric tons their last year's crop. But I said, well, what would it take? Both of them said they'd have to come out with a number close to 140 million metric ton. That would be upsetting the global supply. And right now, we're 11 million above that. And this was the problem. It rained in January. Eight to 18 inches of rain in the northern growing areas in January. It even rained in southern Brazil. And it also rained in Argentina, which is having a phenomenal year. And so the issue right now is the northern growing areas, compared, looking at satellite data compared to a year ago, look pretty good. There's a little bit of stress going on in the middle growing areas, but not enough to be of major concern. And look down there into parts of Uruguay, very far southern Brazil right here, and then Argentina. Absolutely phenomenal looking crops from outer space. Yeah, did Argentina do with some heat recently? Sure, but a front just swiped through them, just like the same one that came through us this afternoon, and it brought up rain out of the south. And the next 10 days in Argentina look really, really wet. If there's a worry spot right now, it's here. But I have a friend, his name is Erico. He lives in Goyas. He's like, we're not really worried about this yet. It's okay for us to be a little dry. We're trying to harvest right now, no problem. The rain that's across the north here, this is happening right when the safrina crop is going into this area. And this is the Amazon. We're not worried about that. We're worried about if this area was dry. So right now, the weather forecasts are killing the markets. They're not helping you out at all because people like me keep saying, uh, crap, it looks okay. And that's what we've got. So is there any hope in this at all? There is. The planting pace of safrina corn is a little off. If anything slows that down more, if it gets way over here over the next couple of weeks, that's a good thing. The later they plant that safrina corn, the more vulnerable it becomes to having the end of the monsoon not provide enough moisture for the crop to go through grain fill. And so if I have a, a bullish story for South America, this is what I'm going to be monitoring. March to April, if El Nino collapses quickly like it did in these years, they tend to be really, really dry in the center and center west growing areas where most of the safrina crop is grown. And we have an El Nino that's fading right now. Our long range models say be prepared for April dryness or even March, April, May dryness in this area. And they're worried about it too. On top of that, in their corn uh, acreage reports, they're off. They're not nearly as big in acres as they were a year ago. So they peel back on acres. They're a little bit late in planting it. And now there's vulnerability at the end of being dry. That is the only good news I have for you about South America right now. That's what I'll be watching for the next couple of months. Every single day in my videos, I finish a video with what's going on in South America, and we cover these things. So if you want to stay on top of it and see if the markets might finally react to this, that's going to be the main story coming out of South America. Now, if we go a little bit north of that, there's another story in the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal back in fall was record dry. And if you don't know how this works, the lake in the middle is the most important part of the Panama Canal lock and dam system. It's all gravity fed. And what happens is the height of that lake is critical to the efficiency of the lock and dam system. At the end of last year, they went through about four months of near record drought in that area. And the lake levels came down so low that the lock and dam system became inefficient. And as it became inefficient, it became expensive to put stuff through the Panama Canal because they couldn't move it through as quickly. As uh, back in December, my good friend Susan tweeted this out and she said that the going rate to get your cargo vessel to the front of the line here was $4 million, a bid price. That's on top of what you've already paid to get in there. And now this was back in December. She then sent me this yesterday. She said, currently the lake is still six feet below where it should be and it's gotta get that, that back. She says that it's changed the way the flow's gone through the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal. Two massive canals over the last couple of weeks, actually over the last couple of months, have dramatically dropped in their shipping route. Where are people going? They have now found that it is economically feasible to instead go through the Cape of Good Hope 
or around Tierra del Fuego in southern uh, parts of, of, of Argentina, this is around the southern tip of South America, than to bother going through our world's biggest canal system. It's just changing the way that everything's being shipped and redistributed. Now, is it a problem during winter for us? No, it's not. We're not putting a lot of fertilizer normally, nor are we putting a lot of grain through the uh, Panama Canal. This is the wrong time of year for that to happen. But should this drought in that area continue all the way till next spring and next summer, then we have another story to be thinking about. But I wanted to bring you up to speed with what was happening on the Panama Canal and show you it. So if you go to this website, marinetraffic.com, you can actually see where all the ships are. It's kind of fun. And every one of them that's a closed circle like that is a ship at anchor. Now, I was talking to Susan about this, and I said, Susan, I've heard that a ship at anchor, a big container ship at anchor, spends an average of $100,000 to $300,000 a day waiting. She goes, yep, that's what we've heard too. And I went in and zoomed in on it, some satellite data. So there's the big lake we're talking about. There's one part of the canal. There's the other part of the canal. And I looked right in through here to see what the ships look like, to see if I could see them on high-resolution satellite data. So I zoomed in, and sure enough, there they all are, waiting to get through. Now, you may have something you bought off Amazon that's sitting out there right now. <laughs> I don't know when it'll ever get to you. But this is a, the whole deflecting risk thing I mentioned earlier. I mean, imagine one of those container ships has something that Walmart needs. Do you think Walmart is going to absorb the $300,000 cost? No. We get to absorb it. It's going to show up in the prices that we pay at the grocery store at, the, at Walmart. That's what other industries can do that we cannot. What happens to us if a big fertilizer shipment gets stuck right there? Fertilizer prices go up, and we have to pay them. This is the kind of thing that we deal with all the time in this part of the world. So just something to think about in terms of global shipping. All right, let's spend the last bit of our time today talking about the United States. This was fun for me. We watched the jet stream for the last 10 days, start in Japan and finish in California at an average speed of 200 miles an hour. Six miles above our heads, constant 200 mile an hour winds. I kept geeking out every morning looking at all the flights coming across the Pacific. This one left Japan seven minutes early. It was expected to arrive in LAX an hour and three minutes early. You wanna know why? Because it was planned to fly at 549 miles an hour but instead of flying a great circle, it flew right in the heart of the jet stream and had a ground speed of 776. That is the speed of sound. Now remember, it's not breaking this sound barrier because it's got a tailwind, but yeah, I know what these flights are like. You've been on one, right? All of a sudden, the pilot comes over the intercom and says, listen, folks, I'm gonna leave the seatbelt light on. It's gonna be a little choppy, but you're gonna get there an hour and three minutes early. And most people are like, Lord, let's do this, man. Let's get to there early. But some people don't handle this very well. So I don't imagine flights across the Pacific have been very fun. What they finished in is this. These are what the winter storms that hit the West Coast look like. If you've not seen them in the news lately, they're massive. This was the first of two winter storms that slammed into the West Coast. If you're curious about the size of that compared to other weather events, remember Hurricane Ian, which hit Florida? That was a big hurricane. You can put 12... Hurricane Ian's inside of this guy right here. That was the first one. The second one hit last Sunday, 250 mile an hour jet stream winds going right into Southern California right there. And if you look at it from a water vapor perspective, it was just dumping moisture into California. These two events gave California a year's worth of water. They just got it. How much? 11 trillion gallons is what we calculated. Two, two systems, that quick. Uh, the Sierra Nevadas just added eight feet of snow, eight feet of snow in, in a weekend. <laughs> and I'm sure you all love to watch the flooding videos from LA and San Diego where people don't know what to do when it rains. They just lose their minds. Do you know the number of people I saw drive under flooded viaducts? And I don't understand how people end up falling into the LA River. It's a big concrete river. Like, what are you doing in there when the water's flowing? I don't get it, but they have to rescue people all the time out of it. But that was it. That was with the systems that came through. Absolutely incredible. I ignored a storm system in Nova Scotia, and I got ringed for it on my YouTube video, because I don't really, they don't grow a lot in Nova Scotia, but California leads the nation in the production of over 40 different fruits and vegetables, so I focused on it. But someone said, why didn't you talk about Nova Scotia? Well, here you go. They got snow too, a lot. <laughs> and the like 49 or 50 people that live there are not happy about it. <laughs> But it is funny when this picture came out, and I, I appreciate them letting me show up my presentation, but look right here, there's a bunch of salt. <laughs> like, what do you, not, it's not enough. You're gonna need, you're gonna need more. 
Now, we've had some pretty wacky weather, and you know what's happened in the middle? It got really warm here, melted all of your snow, and you got epic fogs. And guess what? In April, it's going to rain. So this is, this is all how this all connects. There has been one problem, though, and up until this morning when I pulled this map off, we have been missed out in the northern plains getting good flow back into this area. We, we need to get the polar jet going again so that it can hit us and give us something good. And I'll tell you what I want to happen in a few moments, but it starts with this figure right here. Let me quickly walk you through where we've been so I can tell you where we're going to go as I wrap this up today. All right, December. Everywhere that has the number one in it represents this is the new warmest December on record going back 132 years. You say, what's going on here? Well, what was going on was the Pacific jet was on steroids and all the cold air just got locked up in Alaska and Greenland. I met a couple, this was a week, week a half ago, uh, we were in Reno for an event and I flew down there and when I got off the plane, there was this couple waiting for me in the shuttle bus and the guy starts taking all of his clothes off outside, it was 50 degrees. He has those like, you know, the tearaway pants like, like this, he yanks them off, takes off his sweatshirt and he's just literally standing there in short shorts and a t-shirt. And I look at him, I'm like, where are, you, where are you from? He's like, we just left Fairbanks this morning. And I said, oh, I understand. It was minus 48 in Fairbanks that morning. So when he arrived there, the temperature was 100 degrees warmer than what he left in the morning. And he was just taking a break from Alaska. That was what he told me he was doing. Now, thinking about this, I'm going to tell you something, because two weeks ago, I got asked on the radio, and I had asked a very good question. This guy named Todd Gleason uh, works for a radio station called WILL. It's an NPR affiliate out of, out of Illinois. And he says, Eric, can you just do this for me? This is this ag broadcast. He goes, could you just tell me, if you got to wish cast a winter, we got to make up exactly what you wanted. What would it look like? I said, oh, this is fun. This is a good question, Todd. Listen, you want to know what the best winters are? It's winters that you hate. It's winters that you're still talking about in May. He says, well, what does it look like? I said, this is what I want. I want a really, really mild December, and I want a bunch of rain in December. I want it to soak into that ground before it freezes. I then want twice, once in January, once in February, to not just have epic cold, but like cross polar from Siberia, freeze the soil down to 24 inches kind of cold. I want the kind of cold that's going to destroy our roadways. If all of the Department of Transportation are, are busy in April, May, and June, oh, winter was fantastic for compaction issues. He said, what else? I said, to be honest with you, I want one, just one massive, massive snow event. He says, when do you want it? Sometime between March 20th and April 4th. He's like, that sucks. I'm like, that does suck. I want it to be a snow event where we're getting snow from the Texas Panhandle to Montana all the way to the East Coast. And I want there to be a, at least a foot of snow, but the wet, slushy, nasty stuff. He goes, livestock guys are not going to like you. I said, I don't care. What I need is, I need this to happen so that it soaks in the ground so when they go to plant their crops, all of that moisture is there to be used for the entire year. Because a foot of snow on April 4th has three inches of water in it. And I want that. He says, how close are we this year as to what you want? I said, well, December came in, okay. I like that. This was pretty epic. And then we followed that with one of the other ingredients, which was a brutally cold start to January, January 10th to the 21st, near record. And you had some good snow cover going into this. But I'll never forget this because of her. <laughs> you know, this, I'm sure Peacock, I, that's a picture off my, off my television. Uh, I'm sure Peacock wishes that they would have put a defroster on that, made for a very interesting game. This was the game where it was the, uh, the Dolphins against uh, the Chiefs. Uh, I got interviewed on ESPN radio. They actually called me and said, hey, tell us about the weather. They said, who do you think is going to win? I said, whatever team has a better run game. He said, well, that's the Dolphins. I said, well, I think that's who's going to win. He said, why? I said, because have you ever thrown a football at minus 30? It must change in texture. I said, I, I know Mahomes is good, but still. Then I said, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't think the Dolphins are going to win. They said, well, why did you change your mind? I said, because the Dolphins normally practice in weather conditions that are 110 degrees warmer than what they're going to play in here. Now, I don't think anybody made a bet on me there, but we did have a game where his helmet broke because of how brittle plastic becomes when it's hit hard. And then they canceled the other game that weekend because of lake effect snow, which, by the way, I'll get that in a second. <laughs> I do want to remind you something. Alcohol is a very low freezing point, but if your beer does not have much alcohol in it, it'll freeze no problem. So I thought we'd just point that out. But here comes the other storm system. If you've never seen this, if you've never seen lake effect snow, it is worth your time. It is absolutely amazing to see. And we've had major lake effect snow events this year. And this is a video from 2014 shot by a good friend of mine where he put up his tripod to capture this afternoon of lake effect snow, which is what you see in the background. 
They only got right there a dusting of snow. In three days time, you go one mile down the road into downtown Buffalo, they had 72 inches of snow. That's what Lake Effect can do. And they had to cancel the Bills game because they had all that snow, right? <laughs> now, I appreciate them making this video public so I can show it to you, but did you know that if you live around Orchard Park, New York, you can volunteer to go to the stadium and clear snow? In fact, they're now paying people 21 bucks an hour to do this, or maybe in this guy's case, as much Michelob Ultra as he'll drink, right? <laughs> I want to do this someday. That would be a lot of fun to go down there and help clean the thing out. It was a fruitless effort because of how much snow came in after this, but that's what was going on there. Pretty amazing to see this. Now, because I'm up north today, I'm gonna to make fun of the south. I was at the Kentucky Commodity Conference two weeks ago, and in that conference, about this big, there were two kids sitting in the front row. I'm like, how do they get out of school on a Thursday to come to this? So I just asked them, like, hey, what are you guys, you don't have school today? And like, we haven't had school since Monday. I'm like, what do you mean? And mom chimes in and says, yeah, our kids, had classes canceled, they haven't been since Friday, they had classes canceled on Monday for the forecast of a snow event on Tuesday. I said, why did they cancel on Monday? He said, so we had time to prepare. I'm like, prepare for what? You got an inch of snow. He's like, yeah. And the kids still hadn't gone back to school by Thursday. <laughs> they were out of school for four days on an inch of snow. And when I was there on Thursday, that snow had already melted and gone away. But the fear of snow down there is epic. And that same event, which hit Bowling Green, Kentucky, with a little bit of snow, hit Nashville with a tremendous amount of snow. And Nashville shut down because of this. They have no snow moving equipment down there like we have. And if you're curious why that package from FedEx was late, it was because of that guy. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I've never cut a donut in a giant truck like this, but I think it's gotta be fun. So that guy's out there doing this. And on a little bit more serious note, I do want to let you know that same Arctic outbreak also hit the Pacific Northwest. There's a spot in the Northwest called the Willamette Valley. It's between Eugene and Portland, Oregon. Some of the most productive and fertile ground on earth sits in that valley. Well, they got hit with over an inch of ice. And I always get asked, what's your most feared type of weather? It's this by far. Ice is devastating. It covers such a huge area. It destroys infrastructure. It locks us in place. That is the thing ice gets worried about, is ice like this. We think that this is the nation's first billion-dollar insured loss of 2024, even though it hits such a small area in the Pacific Northwest. Just amazing to see that, all that ice. Now, we did get some ice in the Midwest, okay? And some of that hit the state of Missouri. And did you all see this video went public? This 80,000-pound fire truck? No match. No match at all for a tenth of an inch of ice. Except for that dude somehow still put it in the driveway. That's impressive. <laughs> now there's a comment I'd like to make. Watch it again, this is just crazy. There's a comment I'd like to make about videos like this. I don't know what it is, but the absolute best videos that ever surface on the internet of severe weather always has someone outside on their phone smoking with no teeth. <laughs> and there she is right there. Teeth are inside in a glass, but she's got a video that made it all the way to the major news networks. And I just love it that people like her are out there videotaping it for all of us. But just, this is what we've been dealing with this winter, a lot of rapid fluctuation. Come on, give us a smile. There it is, okay. <laughs> so let's talk about this. Now, this is where we get into some kind of more important stuff. Uh, this was what we had through yesterday. All up, this map just updated while I was on my way over here, so I didn't put the newest one in. But you've got season to date percent of normal snowfall. And what's amazing about this graphic is look at the Northern Plains. Last year, some places in the Northern Plains, all, I mean, not just Northern Plains, but all the way to the upper Midwest, so Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, and the UP of Michigan, we had an excess of 50 inches of snow. And this year, all the snow has been down here in Kansas and Nebraska and parts of Iowa, clipping Missouri, hitting Illinois as well. There's a massive void in this area that needs to be filled in. I'd like it filled in. Let's make it April 4th. I want to ruin that day for you. That's the day I want the blizzard right in through here. We got to be on the lookout for it. Okay, if it happens, profit status, right? Okay, so let's think about this. Now, when we think about what all that snow did, because we did get good snow coverage out of that one event back when the cold air came through. On January 19th, our liquid uh, uh, equivalent in the snow was pretty high. Some places it was up to three to four inches. And my drive over on, on 90, I mean, you can see where all the water's still standing in, in ditches and fields. It's good. We need that. We need all of it. It's messy, but we need it. But this is how things looked on the 19th. This is what they look like uh, today. All that snow is gone because of how mild things have been. By the way, this is exactly what I want. I, I want it to go. Then I want it to get really, really cold again after this. 
This is the perfect kind of winter. The ones you hate give us great growing seasons. Now I want to tell you about what's going on in the eastern Corn Belt. The last 10 days of January, we had a big high pressure cell that sat over the southeast, and it opened up the Gulf. And here in Missouri, this side of Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, big corn and soybean producing states, we just got on unfrozen ground three to four inches of rain. I went out and took a soil sample in December in my backyard, where I live in Illinois. I can go down 16 inches with the probe that I have, and all I pulled up was powder. I did it before I left this past weekend, and we've got mud. It's just all soaked through at least the top 16 inches. That's what that rain just did for us. We bought a lot of insurance with what just happened in that short 10-day time period at the end of the month. So this is the map that I hope kind of stuns us a little bit. Since the beginning of the new year, precipitation ranks. One would be wettest, 132 would be driest. Look at this. You have missed all of the good flow. It's all been way down here. And as a result, this is my top area of most concern. It's not just here. It goes into the Canadian prairie as well. We have got to do something to get the jet stream to move away from California, coming into Oregon or Washington or, or British Columbia to give us better flow. We've got to change the position of it. Until then, we're going to be worried about not getting much moisture in place. Now, what's interesting is the drought monitor, which was mentioned by one of the previous speakers. I want to make sure you know how to use the drought monitor. It is a bit of a trick to use this well to assess drought because it only uses accumulated drought stress to make the map, which means it never shows flash drought and it certainly doesn't show flash flooding. So you have some places that have just received a whole lot of rainfall or snow that yet are yet to see a change in the drought monitor. And by the way, it changed a couple of hours ago. We have a new one out uh, that just comes out every Thursday morning. What's interesting is we have a third of the country still in some form of drought. When we started winter, it was 50%. So we've seen drought reduction, but there are places up here especially that I'm worried about going into drought as we go forward. If you're curious, here's a quick update on the Mississippi River. Back in December, I was down in Memphis, and I took my son, and we went to the top of the Bass Pro Shop. You can take a nice little elevator ride to the top there and see a lot of it. It's a big pyramid if you've never seen it. And uh, I took a picture of the shoreline. My son says, what are you looking at? I'm like, well, normally where that sand is, there's 20 feet of water on top of it. Two and a half weeks ago, it still looked like that. But with all that rain, plus all the snow melt, the river today is 22.3 feet above low stage, which means in the span of two weeks, the river's come up 25 feet, which means the Mississippi is no longer going to be a story going into spring as the ability of putting barge traffic up and down it. Now, as I start to wrap this whole thing up this afternoon, I saved my forecast on what I think is going to happen till now. So I want you all to listen carefully. There are two things I need you to remember when you walk out of here today. If you're thinking about what's happening in the spring and summer, the two things I need you to remember are the most critical map for you to monitor with me from now until you plant a crop and then once it's in the ground to continue monitoring it are these maps. We do a terrible job of measuring soil moisture. The best of the worst is coming from NASA. And what you look at on these maps is a percentile, not percent of moisture, but a rank. So when you see the lowest two percentile, that means it would be the driest over the time period that this is representing, which is 30 years. So what you'll notice here is that since January 1, we have seen improvements overall in the main ag belt of the United States with respect to soil moisture. The state that's hurting the most right now is our neighboring state of Iowa. I was just talking to a large group of Iowans this morning, and they know what they're dealing with there. And I'll show you more about what's happening in Iowa in just a few seconds here. The evolution of the maps over the next four months will tell you if you have anything to combat against episodes of drought in the summer. You will have an episode of drought in the summer regardless of what anybody says about it right now. We live in the northern plains of the United States. You are far from a source of water, so we just have that. That's what we deal with. We, we almost get into desert farming in this part of the world some years. So we're going to watch that to see what kind of insurance we buy. You know what you should also watch it for? Watch it for my state and Indiana, and Ohio, and Iowa. Watch those other states to see if they don't build in the reserves to get us through our dry time periods as well. That's my first point. I make that point because when you ask me to forecast you long range weather for summer, there's only two things I can use. One is the change in soil moisture. The second one are ocean temperatures, and I'll show you that in a few moments. If you would like to know how rough things have been, this is a four year precipitation anomaly map. So I went from January 1 to December 31st of last year, and there are parts of Iowa right in through here. There's one spot right below that 43 
that in 48 months is off by 48 inches of rain. So that is as though it didn't rain for 18 straight months in Iowa, if you combine it all into one short time period. So the soil moisture problems in Iowa, and this also bleeds over into southern Minnesota, this corner of South Dakota, a lot of Nebraska and Kansas, this area right here needs my March 20th to April 4th blizzard. They got to have it. And then after that, they need a lot of rain in spring. They need to get all of that in before they plant a crop to ensure against longer term problems. Because what's made Iowa successful in the last few years has been just in time rains. That random thunderstorm that gets them at the right point to make sure that on their soils, they've got enough to make massive crops. Just in time rains are not something I want to bank on. That's a map you got to remember right in through there. So as we go forward, it was kind of fun driving over here. I think you were all in the meeting, but I drove through this little band right here of snow. This was the forecast from this morning. It went right over the top of us and there were epic snowflakes outside. They were huge. And then it's gone. That low is out and that's all we got out of it. And we're gonna wait for the next big system to come out down here. But unfortunately that system is gonna put its heaviest snow from Texas to Missouri, Illinois, and then somewhere into New England. They could get some big snows out of this in New England. We're left in the lurch, you know why? We don't have any sort of a polar jet coming through. It's all way down here. So unfortunately, we look over the next seven days, all the wet weather south, drier conditions over us. It doesn't mean completely dry, just drier than normal, not much moisture in it. And even if we look out there longer than that, we don't have much hope of getting really, really wet conditions in here until the jet stream reorients itself. That's a 10-day forecast map. Now I go through this part of the presentation fast because every morning I talk about this stuff and you can watch it if you want. But I want to get onto this. When are these temperatures going to change? Because that could spark something to give us a better look. Because the next five days, we're still very warm compared to average here. Even though it's not technically warm outside, you're still about 15 degrees warmer than it could be, or normally is. So how is that hot air going to get out? Well, day five through 10, it's still there. But look at this, day 10 through 15, we poked Alaska, displacing some cold air. And after Valentine's Day, it's going to be gathering right here in the Canadian Prairie. I wanted to just do boom down here. <laughs> just get all the way. In fact, I wanted to go all the way through this place right here. <laughs> that place, it's, I'm being legit. That place is called the Tejano Pass. And if I ever see winds coming through the Gulf that sneak through the Tejano Pass, we're in business. That tells me we have what's called antecedent cold air in the United States, which means the polar jet is doing its job and you get snow. You know what happened all winter last winter? Tejano Pass wind was going. Not right now though. I need to get this down here. Get this cold air in place. We wonder how cold it's gonna get at the end of the month. And right now it's not looking promising to be really, really cold, but we need one more shot of it. So let's now do the speculative part of my talk and wrap this up completely. Long range, are you ready for this? NOAA released this on January 31st. It is their outlook for February. And it was pretty good. I actually agree with them entirely on this. Any shot at cold air we get is going to be limited. And they based almost everything about their forecast on the fact that we have an El Nino that's slowly fading. So this is bullet point number two I want you to take home with you today. Everything I'm going to share with you as I finish up is going to be about this guy right here and the speed at which it fades. We over-attribute weather patterns to El Nino, but El Nino is the background current in our current forecast for spring and summer. Now you will learn in the next couple of minutes what you actually have to pay attention to if there's drought. But right now the competition is over the speed at which this warm water fades back to cold. The European model says slow. The US models say an epic crash of El Nino into La Nina by the time we get into summer. One of them is going to be right. I want to propose to you which one I think is going to be right and show you what this could possibly mean. Let's do something real quick. Those are all my El Nino events across the top and all of the La Nina events across the bottom that have happened since 1950. I have precedent. I can use this to assess the future. And you know what it says for the month of February? It says that normally Februarys are mild across the northern tier of the United States when there is an El Nino. We have limited shots of colder air and we're going to get one of those at the end of the month. It tends to be colder across the south. You get into the Mid-South, the Ohio Valley, we tend to be a bit drier, but there actually is no strong correlation with February precipitation in parts of South Dakota. So taking that, what does it mean? Well, let's now fast forward into spring. 
You see, if El Nino follows the pace set forth by the model that Noah runs, which is one of epic collapse down to strong La Nina, what would that give us? We better ask that question first. And then I'll tell you what I prefer based on some research I've done and also what the scenario would be if I was wrong. Let's do that. Ready? Here we go. If we end up getting a fast collapse of El Nino, what happened in these years right here, those are the ones we can pluck out. May to June opened up the southern tier of the United States to not just active severe weather, but like the kind that is record setting. So if this spring, all we're talking about in the south are massive outbreaks of severe weather, big tornado outbreaks like this, that's actually an indication that El Nino collapsed fast. I'll also be showing you El Nino in my videos, but we'll end up getting a lot of these kind of things. This was in Iowa last, uh, last spring on March 31st. Massive tornado here. This was one of 188 tornadoes we had in a single day. We also had a lot of severe weather south of there in Kansas. This was a video shot by Reed Timmer. He chases tornadoes with his drone. He's actually watching this one go through this community in central Kansas. The National Weather Service warned that storm 30 minutes before it got there. And people in Kansas know what to do. They left. There were no injuries and no fatalities. And look what it did to that community. I always get asked, are tornado, is tornado frequency changing? Is the position of it changing? The answer to that is yes. Mostly out of Texas into the Mid-South. Over the last 40 years, we've been studying the ingredients that make tornadic thunderstorms. We've seen that they've increased more to the east. Your state is pretty much on average with what you've had. No major changes. But here, big changes. We're starting to see more frequent events happen over the Mississippi Valley than they used to in the past. So if the spring starts off extremely violent in the southeast and El Nino collapses quickly, that gives us this possible scenario for summer. Now I'm conflicted over this because if El Nino collapses fast, it could be the best scenario for South Dakota because history would say that if there's drought risk, it is east of the Mississippi, and there's a lot of summer thunderstorm activity here. The heat would be centered over Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, and not so much here. But the reality of this is, is that there will still be an El Nino that will be around through spring. And even if it does collapse more slowly, the scenario for South Dakota is not that bad. Let me show you what I mean. This is if it collapses quickly. Where this is a problem was where I was in Indiana earlier this week. They don't want to see that at all. They want you to have a drought. But I actually gave them a better scenario. I said, what if the European model's right? And El Nino collapses slowly to become neutral by August. Not way down here, which some of the ensemble members do by August, but instead somewhere in this vicinity. What you end up getting out of it is this. History would show us that March should favor what I want which is this, starting here, dipping over the four corner states, rolling toward New England, my blizzard, come on. <laughs> I need this to happen and bake into it some really cold conditions as well. After that, I wanna remind you of something. I don't know what it is in farmer mentality, but for some reason, as soon as Easter is done, we just wanna go and plant stuff. Will you please remember that Easter this year is very early. Do not go out in the first week of April because you will get a frost all the way to the beginning of May. I promise you, don't go after it. I've been asked, well, can you, can you predict April for me? No, no one can. April is the least predictable month of the year. Just if you want to know, it's April. Every El Nino we've had, I want to show you what the temperatures did in April. That's all of them. Do you notice a pattern? Good, there's none. There's no pattern. <laughs> you say, what about precipitation? Is there a, no, there's no pattern. There's nothing. You can't rely on El Nino in a transition month like April. So we're not even gonna to try to do it, but we're gonna go beyond that. Ready? What if we include May into this forecast? These two models, these two maps I'm showing you represent over the last 50 years, a trillion dollars of investment in weather forecasting. 50 years, a trillion bucks has been spent by governments all over the world to make this happen. Earlier today, we had a good joke about the groundhog, right? We yanked this would-be hibernating rodent out of a cage and asked its opinion of the weather. I make the joke that I think it's really just an excuse for Pennsylvanians to drink before dawn on February 2nd. <laughs> Everyone was happy this year. The rodent says we're going to have an early, uh, early spring. I was actually in Pennsylvania the week before that, and I was at a big event, 700 Amish in the crowd. 
And I make the same joke about it. And the three of them cornered me after because, hey, I know you said that the groundhog should be hibernating and I'm not going to do a German Baptist accent for you. But they said, you said, no, our, our groundhogs are coming out of hibernation on February 2nd. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. I thought they came out in March. He goes, no. And he goes, the guy bends into me and he says, hey, but they don't care about the weather. And I said, well, I know that. And he goes, no, you know what they care about? And I think he was making a funny joke. He's like, they just want to find a mate. <laughs> and I'm like, well, thank you for that visual. And anyways, here's the funny thing. The groundhog statistics. We joke about it, right? Groundhog in the last decade has been right four out of 10 times. Four out of 10 times has been right. 40% accurate. That means if you have a coin in your pocket and you flip it, you'll do a better job statistically than the groundhog does. But can I be very transparent with all of you? Do you see these two maps? Last spring, neither of them predicted the drought that hit the Midwest. The skill scores of these two forecasting systems last spring was minus 20%. So when I tell you at the very beginning that no one is capable of predicting the long range weather, including the groundhog or the psychic or me, this is what we're up against. What I use is consistency in model trends. So this is where we're gonna wrap this up. What you notice right now is that the models from March, April, and May, which are predicting a slow demise of El Nino, have decent moisture, green. When we look beyond that and start to ask questions, I'm going to skip this and just get right to the next one there. Sorry, I went one past it. What about for May, June, July? They're attempting to build the biggest drought over Colorado, the Panhandles, and New Mexico. Now listen, if this summer we can get ridging of high pressure to sit here, oh, are we happy. You want Texas to bake. Because if Texas bakes, storms come around the top of it, they run over the ridge, and hammer North Dakota and South Dakota. And we have a fantastic, a fantastic season. You need Texas to have problems. But right now the models, just released this week, say May, June, and July, still not seeing a problem. That's a good bit of news. But do you know what I just did? I just shot myself in the foot. Because I didn't tell you disaster was coming. And when these are ultimately wrong, you'll be like, wait a minute, you said, I'm like, no, remember I said I don't know, but I'm showing you what we got. Can I tell you what really needs to happen? Because our government thinks the same thing. March, April, May, April, May, June, May, June, July, June, July, August, where are they putting all the heat? In the Western Plains. Where are they putting the drought? In the Western Plains. Not affecting most of you in this room. Just thinking about what this all means though, I need to finish with one last thing today, okay? Listen carefully, because I spent the whole beginning of my talk talking about all these people that think they can predict drought with certain ways. This is actually what happens. This is the real bit. You have two high pressure cells that flank North America. One's called the Pacific High, one's called the Bermuda High. They're always there. They meander in their strength and position, and that's the only thing we can monitor throughout the year to tell you if you're gonna have a drought. Why do we monitor them? Because if the Bermuda High's in place, it opens up the Gulf of Mexico, which can transport moisture clear to the Canadian Shield. That's your source of moisture for all your thunderstorms. If the Bermuda High leaves for any reason, we have problems. We cut off our southerly flow. And if the Pacific High leaves at the same time, we're doubly screwed and we get what's called an omega block. That is the most feared weather pattern here. Now listen to me carefully. This is the last thing I'm gonna tell you. Is there any preseason indicator that you could have weakened or displaced semi-permanent high pressure cells like the Bermuda High or Pacific High? If there is, the oceans are gonna telegraph that. You see, water has a specific heat five times greater than soil, which means it takes a long time for its temperature to change, which means it's ultimately giving us a symptom of what the atmosphere is up to. And what I want you to think about is this. In every massive drought episode, we've had cold water here. And it's set up in spring developing this. Now, I'm gonna ask you to do a forecast for me. You ready? This is the forecast for ocean temperatures by the world's most statistically accurate model. I'm, I'm gonna ask you, literally, not rhetorically, but I want you to answer. Watch as I press play, going from February to March, here it is, April, and May, June, July, and August. We do have La Nina symptoms showing back up. But if you look at this particular figure, knowing what I just taught you, is there any reason for me today to tell you that you're gonna have a disastrous drought? Yes or no? no? No. Where's my evidence of doing this other than to scare you if I felt like it? If those waters warm up over the next few months, then we're in good shape. Ridge riders, lots of storms, good conditions. Now,
Could the model be wrong? You bet. I just told you that was wrong last year. So what do you want to watch? Soil moisture. That's your insurance. And then these ocean temps. That's the symptom. In fact, you don't have to watch them. I will watch them and tell you about it every single day on agweather.com. That's it. Thank you so much for letting me talk to you today. Hopefully this was a good conference for you, and we'll wrap it up here. I do, yeah, if you want, yep. All right, got me? All right, thanks. Any questions, anybody got anything earth shattering they want to answer? About weather. Oh, weather, we gotta yeah. keep it the weather? <laughs> please, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff people ask me. Yes, please. So we watch your videos like on a daily basis. Yeah. We talk a lot about in the summertime, like I don't remember what it was, 60, 70% of our rain in the summertime is all convective in nature. Yes. And the models don't pick up on that. Terribly. Has that changed over time? No. <laughs> His question was, you, I, in my videos I often talk about during summer that convection's what dominates your precipitation, thunderstorms. And uh, he asked, has that changed over time? Are we seeing anything that's different? But the only thing that you, I could tell you that you've seen different is, I did some st a study that found out that in the last 40 years, South Dakota has doubled the frequency of your heavy rainfall events, the ones where you get more than two inches in a day, but at the consequence of giving you longer dry stretches in between. But the reality of it is, and this is what is the kicker about my job and my life, I am the best at forecasting the weather in winter and the worst in summer. All of us are. Because summer weather is driven by convection. Those are thunderstorms. And here's the issue. So listen up. Have you ever noticed, I'm, all of you are going to nod when I say this, you ever noticed that there are certain years where that dude keeps getting rain and you do not? Are we all comfortable with this? This is what happens, okay? This is a great question that you brought up. In spring into early summer, the atmosphere is laying down the groundwork of where the moisture is going to be available to recycle. And if you have a spot that gets hit a few extra times in spring or early summer and the moisture is already locally available, the local atmosphere will use that again to make new thunderstorms. And guess what they do? They just pull it back up and put it right back down. And they very rarely evict it or move it off into different places. So let's imagine that he is the spot that gets the rain and you're two counties over. The rain pops up there and it rains right next to him. And by the time it gets to you, the storm is done and split and died. And that's because your local environment didn't have the moisture in it to support the further development of that storm. That whole pattern only breaks when something massive comes through and kicks it out, like a big derecho event or an ill-timed cold front or something that can outdo the local convective environment. So the reality is summer weather is dominated by pop-up thunderstorms. And sometimes he gets it and you don't, and it is just bad luck. That's a great point to bring up. Is there another question? That's right. By the way, do you all know what the worst spot in the country to forecast for is? Who has the lowest skill score according to the National Weather Service? Rapid City, by far. That's the one spot we can't forecast. We're terrible, we shouldn't even try. You're talking about two counties over, but can it be as small as like a, a township? Area? Yeah, normal storm sizes for these pop-up storms are like 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. They're, I mean, so six miles by six miles. Uh, and, and they're just, they go straight up, they dump all the rain, and then they're done. They actually kill themselves. All that updraft goes up and builds the cloud, gravity wins and pulls it right back down and puts down its downdraft, and he gets it and you don't. That, that is summer every summer. We just try to predict when is the environment ready to give you the storms that just repeatedly go over the same area to keep moving a county over every time to get the moisture to places it isn't in. That's what ridge riders are. They just keep rolling over the ridge, pushing it farther and farther east during summer. That's a challenging thing to figure out. Oh, and by the way, I know there's a lot of apps out there that can predict your uh, rainfall, or not predict it, but show you what you got. Have you noticed they're all terrible? That's because you don't have enough rain gauges across the state to verify the radars. We need to actually not just double up, but we need a 10x increase on our surface weather stations to actually give you good information. If we did that, we'd stop using the drop monitor to do all of your insurance as well. We'd use those. Yeah. Yeah. But the last few years, as you go west, they're getting our rain, and we're not getting them here. Especially last year. Can you tell me what, what happened? happened? Yeah. Let me give you the case in point for last year real quick. So in May of last year, the Bermuda High went on a European vacation. And in the middle, it left a massive ridge over Canada. It burned 20 million hectares of land in Canada. 
So if the ridge is here and you're right there, the flow comes around a ridge like this out of the east. And when flow comes out of the east, it's not pulling any moisture from like the Great Lakes or Eastern Canada. But as it continues to go to the east, you know that as you go, let me, I'm sorry, out of the east to the west, the land is actually rising. It's actually helping force the air to rise and make clouds and precipitation. So last year especially, that time period in spring where the eastern side of the state was dry and the western side of the state was wet was because the high pressure wasn't in Texas, it was up in Ontario. We don't want that. Everybody wants high pressure in Texas because it comes over the top and blows all the moisture from the west to the east to make storms. So Canadian ridges are the springs where you are dry east and wet west. So the, so the fire in Canada yep. had something to do with this? It did. The fire in Canada also did one other very positive things, all of the fires in Canada. We just finished a study last month that found that the only effect that we could measure out of the Canadian wildfire smoke was that it kept summer temperatures five to seven degrees colder than they would have been otherwise. That smoke saved a lot of crop this year. It was pretty epic too, by the way. How come it seems like lately all our big rains come in from the south instead of coming in from the west? Yeah, so what's happened uh, in the previous years when you had these crazy, crazy windy springs, we had an invigorated jet that came off the Rocky Mountains, produced a big rain shadow, just blasted east. Last year, actually the last 18 months, we've shut that all down. So now you're getting southerly advection, so storms coming out, or moisture coming out of the Gulf, and the trajectory of these storm systems is entirely different. So what could change that is, if the polar jet gets its act together and starts cranking again, yeah, all your weather's gonna come out of the west like it normally does. But last night, I mean, that was perfect evidence. Everything came out of the south last night. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you've opened up the Gulf. And be honest, keep it open as long as we can. Yes. Oh. Uh, I'm 57 years old. Mm -hmm. I was growing up, we had a lot of wind out of the north and out of the northwest. Okay. The house was always cold when I was a kid. <laughs> Planted a lot of trees to stop that. Yeah. Now we're getting a lot of wind out of the south. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're blaming me on this. I, <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. It's like a five-decade thing. I know, yeah. Yeah, so, so there has been one, one thing that has changed a lot in the last seven decades, and that is the North Pacific, where I just told you to watch ocean temperatures, it has actually been systematically getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So what that has done is that's taken the jet stream and shoved it way up into Alaska, and then it comes down over the Rocky Mountains and typically skirts across us going just to our south. Now, you were riding the clock back to the 1970s, the jet stream didn't jump up way into Alaska. It came much more straight across, which is why you had better north winds. And you had colder winters, too, by the way, during then. Colder overnight lows. The other big consequence of that change has been uh, South Dakota in the last 70 years has picked up in its growing season two and a half inches of rain. You're actually wetter now than you were back in the 50s and 60s and 70s by about two and a half inches. But the problem is your question. It's coming more in big helpings followed by longer stretches of drier weather. I will tell you what we're doing in Illinois because we have the same problem, but we've increased by four inches of rain during the growing season, and our rainfall events, when they come through because we're closer to the Gulf, are huge. You drive through Illinois right now because there's no snow on the ground, and I, I guarantee you every two miles, you'll see fresh black stripes through every field. And these are guys that are either fixing tile or putting new tile in to combat all the wet weather we have there. It is super rare for us to be very dry in eastern Corn Belt right now. Good points. Is there one more question? Yes, please. What's your thoughts on Kokoraz? Kokoraz? Yes. It's the best thing ever. Kokoraz is the public um, a weather station, weather data collection. We absolutely rely on it because you are adding to our weather uh, service monitored weather stations with reliable people that take good reports. I love Kokoraz. It's good. Are you a Kokoraz contributor? 30 years. 30 years. Keep doing it, please because our government won't fund my 10x increase on weather stations. I asked last June in front of them, can you please put down 90,000 weather stations in the United States? They listened, but it didn't happen, so. <laughs> Who funds that? Our, our, our government funds it. The, the federal government was gonna fund that. NRCS. Uh, well, NRCS does fund certain things, and our NRCS guy, where is he? Hiding in the back, okay. Um, I have seen them fund some really interesting programs. I've watched uh, saturated buffers go in under your dollar, um, and I've also seen some drainage projects go in under it. But in terms of weather stations, I don't know that they get involved in that. 
So NOAA does, though. So I was testifying before Congress on behalf of agriculture, invited by NOAA, and said, where should we spend $400 million? And I said, better observations, better computing infrastructure to do better forecasting. They got the funding, but I don't know what they've spent it on yet. Yeah, I think it would be, to be honest, to help some of the insurance project products that NRCS has, I would very much support a nationwide mesonet of weather stations. North Dakota has one. Minnesota has one. I don't know if South Dakota does. Does it have a mesonet? Yeah. This is such good news. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Yes. I did not know that. That is so good. You should be very, my state won't do it. We have other problems in Illinois, but I'm so glad that you guys are doing this because it's the best thing you could do. If you, for ag, you gotta have more observations. Yes. So Canada is extremely dry. In fact, I met a canola grower last year that grew a crop on three inches of rain from April to October. He says, I can't believe he got it out, but that's what they had. So their problem right now in Canada is a residual problem. So all the fertilizers and some of them, pesticides and herbicides were put on, didn't get enough rain to get rid of all that. So there's a big section of Alberta going over to Manitoba. So Saskatchewan's in the middle, of course, that received less than five inches of rain through the whole growing season last year. So they're still in drought right now and they've not gotten any moisture this winter. My actually bigger concern for fires <clears throat> is the Western US this upcoming year. Because whenever they have really, really wet winters, they get a whole bunch of vegetative growth in spring, and all of that gets hot and dry and dries out by the time you get to summer, and it's just there to be burned later in the year. Some years our smoke comes from California, Oregon, and Washington instead of British Columbia. Okay, I think we should wrap it up there because you all want to go out and enjoy the beautiful day outside, so I'll stop and say thank you again. This was a lot of fun. All right, thanks for being here. Yeah.